The Sunday sermons of St. Alphonsus to the Gary, Sermon 45, for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost on Impurity. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had the dropsy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. The man who indulges in impurity is like a person laboring under the dropsy. The latter is so much tormented by thirst that the more he drinks, the more thirsty he becomes. Such, too, is the nature of the accursed vice of impurity. It is never satisfied. As says St. Thomas of Villanova, the more the dropsical man abounds in moisture, the more he thirsts. So, too, is it with the waves of carnal pleasures. I will speak today of the vice of impurity and will show in the first point the delusion of those who say that this vice is but a small evil, and in the second, the delusion of those who say that God takes pity on this sin and that he does not punish it. First point. Delusion of those who say that sins against purity are not a great evil. The unchaste then say that sins contrary to purity are but a small evil. Like the soul wallowing in the mire, they are immersed in their own filth, so that they do not see the malice of their actions, and therefore they neither feel nor abhor the stench of their impurities, which excite disgust and horror in all others. Can you, who say that the vice of impurity is but a small evil, can you, I ask, deny that it is a mortal sin? If you deny it, you are a heretic. For as St. Paul says, do not err, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, etc., shall possess the kingdom of God. It is a mortal sin. It cannot be a small evil. It is more sinful than theft or detraction or the violation of the fast. How then can you say that it is not a great evil? Perhaps mortal sin appears to you to be a small evil. Is it a small evil to despise the grace of God, to turn your back upon him, and to lose his friendship for a transitory, beastly pleasure? St. Thomas teaches that, teaches that mortal sin, because it is an insult offered to an infinite God, contains a certain infinitude of malice. A sin committed against God has a certain infinitude on account of the infinitude of the divine majesty. Is mortal sin a small evil? It is so great an evil that if all of the angels and the saints, the apostles, martyrs, and even the mother of God offered all their merits to atone for a single mortal sin, the oblation would not be sufficient. No, for that atonement or satisfaction would be finite. But the debt contracted by mortal sin is infinite on account of the infinite majesty of God, which has been offended. The hatred which God bears to sins against purity is great beyond measure. If a lady find her plate soiled, she is disgusted and cannot eat. Now with what disgust and indignation must God, who is purity itself, behold the filthy impurities by which his law is violated. He loves purity with an infinite love, and consequently, he has an infinite hatred for the sensuality which the lewd, voluptuous man calls a small evil. Even the devils, who held a high rank in heaven before their fall, disdain to tempt men to sins of the flesh. St. Thomas says that Lucifer who is supposed to have been the devil that tempted Jesus Christ in the desert, tempted him to commit other sins, but scorned to tempt him to offend against chastity. Is this sin a small evil? Is it then a small evil to see a man endowed with a rational soul and enriched with so many divine graces bring himself by the sin of impurity to the level of a brute? Fornication and pleasure, says St. Jerome, 
pervert the understanding and change men into beasts. In the voluptuous and unchaste are literally verified the words of David. A man, when he was in honor, did not understand. He is compared to senseless beasts and has become like unto them. St. Jerome says that there is nothing more vile or degrading than to allow oneself to be conquered by the flesh. Nihil vilius quam vincia carne. Is it a small evil to forget God and to banish him from the soul for the sake of giving the body a vile satisfaction of which when it is over you feel ashamed? Of this the Lord complains by the prophet Ezekiel, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thou hast forgotten me, and hast cast me off behind thy back. St. Thomas says that by every vice, but particularly by the vice of impurity, men are removed from God. Per, lux, per luxurium maxime recited adeo. Moreover, Sins of impurity, on account of their great number, are an immense evil. A blasphemer does not always blaspheme, but only when he is drunk or provoked to anger. The assassin, whose trade is to murder others, does not at the most commit more than eight or ten homicides. But the unchaste are guilty of an unceasing torrent of sins. By thoughts, by words, by looks by complacencies and by touches so that when they go to confession they find it impossible to tell the number of the sins they have committed against purity even in their sleep the devil represents to them obscene objects that on awakening they may take delight in them and because they are made the slaves of the enemy they obey and consent to his suggestions for it is easy to contract a habit of the sin. To other sins, such as blasphemy, detraction, and murder, men are not prone, but to this vice nature inclines them. Hence, St. Thomas says that there is no sinner so ready to offend God as the votary of lust is on every occasion that comes to him. The sin of impurity brings in its train the sins of defamation or theft hatred, and a boasting of his own filthy abominations, because it ordinarily involves the malice of scandal. Other sins, such as blasphemy, perjury, and murder, excite horror in those who witness them. But this sin excites and draws others who are flesh to commit it, or at least to commit it with less horror. Yes, besides, it ordinarily involves the malice of scandal. By lust, the devil triumphs over the entire man, over his body and over his soul, over his memory, filling it with the remembrance of unchaste delights, in order to make him take complacency in them, over his intellect, to make him desire occasions of committing sin, over the will, by making it love its impurities as its last end, and as if there were no God, I made, said Job, a covenant with my eyes that I would not so much as think upon a virgin. For what part should God for from above have in me? Job was afraid to look at a virgin because he knew that if he consented to a bad thought, God should have no part in him. According to St. Gregory, from impurity arises blindness of understanding destruction, hatred of God, and despair of eternal life. St. Augustine says that, through the that though the unchaste may grow old, the vice of impurity does not grow old in them. And St. Thomas says that there is no sin in which the devil delights so much as, this, as in this sin, because there is no other sin to which nature clings with so much tenacity. To the vice of impurity it adheres so firmly that the appetite for carnal pleasures becomes insatiable. Go now and say that the sin of impurity is but a small evil. At the hour of death you shall not say so. Every sin of that kind shall appear to you 
a monster of hell, much less. So shall you say so before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, who will tell you what the apostle has already told you, no fornicator or unclean hath inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. The man who has lived like a brute does not deserve to sit with the angels. Most beloved brethren, let us continue to pray to God to deliver us from this vice. If we do not, we shall lose our souls. The sin of impurity brings with it blindness and obstinacy. Every vice produces darkness of understanding, but impurity produces it in a greater degree than all other sins. Fornication and wine and drunkenness take away the understanding. Wine deprives us of understanding and reason. So does impurity. Hence St. Thomas says that the man who indulges in unchaste pleasures does not live according to reason. Now if the unchaste are deprived of light and no longer see the evil which they do, how can they abhor it and amend their lives? The prophet O.C. says that being blinded by their own mire, they do not even think of returning to God because their impurities take away from them all knowledge of God. They will not set their thought to return to God, for the spirit of fornication is in the midst of them, and they have not known the Lord. Hence, St. Lawrence Justinian writes that this sin makes men forget God. Delights of the flesh induce forgetfulness of God. And St. John Damascene teaches that the carnal man cannot look at the light of truth. Thus the lewd and voluptuous no longer understand what is meant by the grace of God, by judgment, hell, and eternity. Fire hath fallen upon them, and they shall not see the sun. Some of these blind miscreants go so far as to say the fornication is not in itself sinful. They say that it was not forbidden in the old law, and in support of this execrable doctrine, they adduced the words of the Lord to O.C., go take, the wife of for take a wife of fornication, and have of her children of fornication. In answer, I say that God did not permit Osi to commit fornication, but wished him to take for his wife a woman who had been guilty of fornication, because the mother had been guilty of that crime. This is, according to St. Jerome, the meaning of the words of the Lord to Osi. But fornication was always forbidden, under pain of mortal sin in the old as well as in the new law. St. Paul says, No fornication or unclean hath inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Behold the impiety to which the blindness of such sinners carries them. From this blindness it arises that, though they go to the sacraments, their confessions are null for want of true confession. For how is it possible for them to have true sorrow when they neither know nor abhor their sins? The vice of impurity also brings with it obstinacy. To conquer temptations, particularly against chastity, continual prayer is necessary. Watch ye and pray that ye not enter into temptation. But how will the unchaste, who are always seeking to be tempted, pray to God to deliver them from temptation? They sometimes, as St. Augustine confessed of himself, even abstain from prayer through fear of being heard and cured of the disease which, which they wish to continue. I feared, said the saint, that you would soon hear and heal the disease of concupiscence, which I wish to be satiated rather than extinguished. St. Peter calls this vice an unceasing sin having eyes full of adultery and sin that ceaseth not. Impurity is called an unceasing sin on account of the obstinacy which it induces. Some persons addicted to this vice say, I always confess the sin, so much the worse. For since you always relapse into the sin, these confessions serve to make you persevere in the sin. The fear of punishment is diminished by saying, I always confess the sin, if you felt that this sin certainly merits hell, you would scarcely say, I will not give it up. I do not care if I am damned. But the devil deceives you. Commit this sin, he says, for you afterward confess it. But to make a good confession of your sins, you must have true sorrow of the heart 
and a firm purpose to sin no more. Where are this sorrow and this firm purpose of amendment when you always return to the vomit? If you had had these dispositions and had received sanctifying grace at your confessions, you should not have relapsed, or at least you should have abstained for a considerable time from relapsing. You have always fallen back for a considerable time from relapsing. You have always fallen back into sin in eight or ten days, and perhaps in a shorter time after confession. What sign is this? It is a sign that you are always in enmity with God. If a sick man instantly vomits the medicine which he takes, it is a sign that his disease is incurable. St. Jerome says that the vice of impurity, but when habitual, will cease when the unhappy man who indulges in it is cast into the fires of hell. O oh, infernal fire, lust whose fuel is gluttony, whose sparks are brief conversations, whose end is hell. The unchaste become like the vulture that waits to be killed by the fowler, rather than abandon the rottenness of the dead bodies in which it feeds. This is what happened to a young female who, after having lived in the habit of sin with a young man, fell sick and appeared to be converted. At the hour of death, she asked leave of her confessor to send for the young man in order to exhort him to change his life at the sight of her death. The confessor very imprudently gave the permission and taught her what she should say to her accomplice in sin. But listen to what happened. As soon as she saw him, she forgot her promise to the confessor and the exhortation she was to give to the young man. And what did she do? She raised herself up, sat in the bed, and stretched her arms to him and said, Friend, I have always loved you, and even now at the end of my life I love you. I see that on your account I shall go to hell, but I do not care. I am willing for the love of you to be damned. After this word, she fell back on the bed and expired. These facts are related by Father Sanieri. Oh, how difficult is it for a person who has contracted a habit of this vice to amend his life. And return sincerely to God. How difficult is it for him not to terminate this habit in hell? Like the unfortunate young woman of whom I have just spoken. Second point. Illusion of those who say that God takes pity on this sin. The votaries of lust say that God takes pity on this sin. But such is not the language of St. Thomas of Villanova. He says that in the sacred scriptures we do not read of any sin so more severely chastised as the sin of impurity. We find in the scriptures that in punishment of the sin a deluge of fire descended from heaven on four cities and in an instant consumed not only the inhabitants but even the very stones. And the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he destroyed those cities and all things that spring from the earth. St. Peter Damien relates that a man and woman who had sinned against purity were found burnt and black as a cinder. Salvian writes that it was in punishment of the sin of impurity that God sent on the earth the universal deluge, which was caused by the continual rain for 40 days and 40 nights. In this deluge, the waters rose 15 cubits above the tops of the highest mountains and only eight persons, along with Noah, were saved in the ark. The rest of the inhabitants of the earth, who were more numerous than at, than at present, were punished with death in chastisement of the vice of impurity. Mark the words of the Lord in speaking of this chastisement, which he inflicted on that sin. My spirit shall not remain in man forever, because he is flesh, that is says Liranus, too deeply involved 
in carnal sins. The Lord added, For it repenteth me that I made man. The indignation of God is not like ours, which clouds the mind and drives us into excess. His wrath is a judgment perfectly just and tranquil, by which God punishes and repairs the disorders of sin. But to make us understand the intensity of his hatred for the sin of impurity, he represents himself as if sorry for having created man, who offended him so grievously by this vice. We at the present day see more severe temporal punishment inflicted on this than on any other sin. Go into the hospitals and listen to the shrieks of so many young men who in punishment of their impurities are obliged to submit to the severest treatment and to the most painful operations and who if they escape death according to the divine threat feeble and subject to the most excruciating pain for the remainder of their lives. Thou hast cast me off behind thy back, bear thou also thy wickedness and thy fornications. St. Remigius writes that if children be accepted, the number of adults that are saved is few on account of the sins of the flesh. In conformity with this doctrine, it was revealed to a holy soul that his pride has filled hell with devils, so impurity fills it with men. St. Isidore assigns the reason. He says that there is no vice which so much enslaves men to the devil as impurity. Hence, St. Augustine says that with regard to this sin, the combat is common and the victory rare. Hence it is that on account of this sin, hell is filled with souls. All that I have said on this subject has been said. Not that anyone present who has been addicted to the vice of impurity may be driven to despair, but that such per persons may be cured. Let us then come to the remedies. There are two great remedies, prayer and the flight of dangerous occasions. Prayer, says St. Gregory of Nyssa, is the safeguard of chastity. And before him, Solomon, speaking of himself, said the same. And as I knew that I could not otherwise be continent except God, God gave it. I went to the Lord and besought him, thus it is impossible for us to conquer this vice without God's assistance. Hence, as soon as a temptation against chastity presents itself, the remedy is to turn instantly to God for help and to repeat several times the most holy names of Jesus and Mary, which have a special virtue to banish bad thoughts of that kind. I have said immediately, without listening to or beginning to argue with the temptation, when a bad thought occurs to the mind, it is necessary to shake it off instantly as you would a spark that flies from the fire and instantly to evoke aid from Jesus and Mary. As to the flight of dangerous occasions, St. Philip Nero used to say that cowards, that is, they who fly from the occasions, gain the victory. Hence you must, in the first place, keep a restraint on the eyes and must abstain from looking at young females. Otherwise, says St. Thomas, you can scarcely avoid this sin. Hence Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not so much as think upon a virgin. He was afraid to look at a virgin, because from looks it is easy to pass to desires and from desires to acts. St. Francis de Sales used to say that to look at a woman does not do so much evil as to look at her a second time. If the devil has not gained a victory the first, he will gain it the second time. And if it be necessary to abstain from looking at females, it is much more necessary to avoid conversation with them. Carry not among women, we should be persuaded that in avoiding occasions of this sin, no caution can be too great. Hence we must always be fearful and fly from them. A wise man feareth, and declineth from evil. A fool is confident. A wise man is timid, and flies away. A fool is confident, 
and falls. St. Alphonsus de Liguri, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.